Joe Lonsdale just revealed what AI executives are really telling investors behind closed doors. This one is a juicy one. Check it out. President Trump ordering the Pentagon to restart nuclear testing. This follows an announcement from Russian President, President Vladimir Putin that they successfully tested its Poseidon uh, nuclear-capable super torpedo. Joining us right now is Joe Lonsdale, Palantir's co-founder and ADVC fund, founding partner of ADVC and an Apollo and uh, Apollo Global. They just announced a partnership yesterday to fund the innovators rebuilding American industry. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But given actually your role at Palantir, I just, I'm actually yeah. curious... We had sort of a fascinating split screen in the past 24 hours. On one end, you had this tariff truce, maybe deal, temporary something, maybe more than that, with China. And at the same time, you heard the president say, we're going to start testing nuclear weapons. And I think people are trying to make sense of the two. <laughs> well, we had a good conversation, it sounds like, with Xi last night while we were sleeping. And he said it was 12 out of 10. They got what he wanted, which I think is good for the markets, positive overall. Uh, this conflict with with Russia, it was not as the war was not as easy to end apparently as as some of us were hoping. And I think he tested these. I mean, listen, the, these, these are scary things they have over the last ten years. Russia's developed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like a, the self driving car of nuclear weapon. These things go in the water, and it's you know we our nuclear triad. We don't have these as far as I know. These are different. We don't need them. We have a triad already. These things are these things are scary. They could take out cities. And he's showing that he's talking about those. He's testing fourteen thousand kilometer, you know, right. missiles with nukes on them. We. we we have, we, have a, we have a lot of nukes, too, and it's important we show that we have a deterrent. Trump's saying the right things. And do you think, just real quick, that this is... Real, I mean, we were talking to Ambassador Burns earlier. Given the timing of that announcement, you know, obviously, contextually, he talked about it in the context of Russia. But he also announced it with, within the timing of his talks with President Xi. So how related do you think these two are? Listen, I think Trump knows you have to show, show strength, right? And I think you have to show strength in a respectful way. It's probably a better way to show strength talking about it versus another adversary when you're when you're going right. to visit someone's home. Do you think it was a mistake then over the last 30 years for us not to be doing such a thing? I mean, I mean President Bush, you know, many years ago tried to de-escalate things in this context. You know, I think I think there's certain parts of the world where when you show strength, it's really important. I think I think America was so dominant, like so dominant in the 80s and 90s, especially after the Cold War ended, that you almost didn't even need to say it. I think at this point, uh, if you look at what she said and thinks about China, he said he thinks the West is in decline. He's growing. We're showing him that's not true. We're showing him with our, our new advances we're making in, in, in the defense world. We're showing with what Trump's saying. We're not just going to fade away and be an easy target. You better watch out. Let's talk about this deal with Apollo. What's this about? You know, uh, as we all know, there's a lot of really exciting things going, in, uh, going on in AI. It's actually working. It turns out over the next... 10 years, we're going to reindustrialize the U.S. We're going to bring back advanced manufacturing. We're going to do it in every area. We're going to do it in bio. We're going to do it in aerospace. We're going to do it, you know, in all sorts of parts of our economy. It's going to need trillions of dollars. Uh, you know, a lot of cases we build companies. I put a lot of equity in. They get growing. They're really big. But there's a lot of assets. We're going to transform their value. That means lots of different types of financing. Apollo is one of the world's best at this. They manage around a trillion dollars. Uh, we need types of capital and expertise from people like that for our companies to help build in the U.S. Hmm. How that's a different type of, like, I always think of Silicon Valley as being this asset light type of, um, uh, the, this CapEx light sort of um, investments, and that's been great for it. But, man, that has shifted over the last well, couple there, of Well, years. there's lots of things. So, first of all, it's the fact that opening eye needs infinite cash. And that's right. A, and, that's, and, that, and in some ways, that's separate, though. So, think about this. Like, one of our companies, a bunch of ex-talent from Waymo, uh, these guys are some of the best in the world. They're doing autonomous excavators, right? 25% of all construction in the U.S. uses these excavators. You can do them without... People actually that makes a lot more projects pencil. But if you're going to start doing these projects, for example, you can run a quarry much more efficiently. There's 6,000 quarries. These are assets you can transform now with technology. Wow. That requires a lot more scale of capital. That, that, I mean, that is amazing. And it's great to hear the rebuilding of America and reindustrializing things here. But it sounds like it's going to be done with a lot fewer workers, blue collar workers than we've seen in the past. Well, this is, that, is, is that the idea for it? I think it's really important in economics to understand in order to make these projects pencil, in order to make them efficient, you need to do them more efficiently. So overall, you can still create more jobs, more so it activity. Will create more jobs overall. Hundred percent. I think yeah. Jevons' paradox is a really important point in economics, yeah. where when the price of when, when the price of uh, the efficiency of coal plants doubled, so you needed half as much coal. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the demand for coal went up. Everyone was worried who was investing in coal back in the ninth century. Oh no, you're not going to need as much. Turns out, if you could do more with it more cheaply, you need a lot more. And so this this is especially when it comes to building things. You, you you're going to have a lot more labor if you could do it more cheaply. Yeah.
Right. Palantir's co-founder Joe Lonsdale says foundational model companies are hiding their true capital needs from investors, but that proves AI is real, not a bubble. Joe reveals that OpenAI and Anthropic executives privately tell him they're deliberately understating how much capital and energy they'll need because they don't want to spook investors. Joe's insights here cut through all the AI bubble panic. AI companies are lying to their investors to hide how much demand actually exists. Every quarter, they come back asking for more, not because the technology failed, but because it succeeded beyond what they initially planned for. The infrastructure can't keep up with how fast people want to use their products. Bubbles happen when you build for demand that doesn't exist. For example, fiber optic cables in the dot-com era. Companies laid millions of miles of cables that nobody used. It sat dark in the ground for years, and AI is the opposite problem. They can't build fast enough. For the first time ever, corporate infrastructure spending is driving more economic growth than consumers buying things. Shopping used to be the engine of the economy. Now it's companies racing to build compute capacity. And Joe nails the critical point everyone overlooks. He's invested in the applications layer, the companies building actual products on top of these models. Those companies are profitable right now, not in five years, not theoretically, but today with current technology. If everything froze tomorrow and no AI model got better, the applications layer would still print money. That's the opposite of a bubble. In real bubbles, nothing works until some future breakthroughs happen. Here, it already works. Companies are shipping products, customers are paying, the foundation model companies might be burning cash to get better, but the ecosystem around them is already generating real returns. Plus, when you dump hundreds of billions into infrastructure, you're not just burning money into thin air. You are building assets. Data centers don't disappear if AI slows down. Power infrastructure services other purposes. NVIDIA chips can run other workloads. Compare that to dot-com companies that had nothing but a website and a dream. When those companies failed, there was nothing left. When you build physical infrastructure, every downturn leaves valuable assets behind. Joe sees this clearly. The foundational model race might be uncertain with uncertain economics, but the broader AI build-out is grounded in tangible value creation happening right now. But the Palantir valuation debate is an interesting one where Joe's perspective gives an interesting insight. Talk about building things. Data centers are being built all over this country. Everywhere. I mean, it's just, it's, it's coursing through the economy. And the question that has been raised on this broadcast and, and elsewhere for the last month, if not more, is whether we are in some kind of bubble, whether there is a demonstrable ROI behind it, whether it's a religion, um, <laughs> whether, whether you can actually do the math uh, and whether the math makes sense. I, I was what sitting, say you? I was sitting with friends actually a few nights ago in San Francisco from OpenAI and Anthropic and the, the usual suspects. And actually it was funny what they were telling me, I'm gonna get myself in trouble here, but they were saying basically these companies are afraid to scare their investors. And so they're telling them they need a lot less capital, a lot less energy than they know they actually do. So you're going to see every three to six months as we have, oh, wow, it turns out we actually need a lot more energy. We actually need a lot more capital in data centers. So, so, so if, if anything, I think we're underestimating how much investment's going to go into this space, how much they're going to need. So I don't disagree with you about how much we're going to need to make it work. The question is whether you think that there's math on the other side to pay for it all, given the fact that, at least right now, the economics don't you know, look favorable in this, in this particular moment? The economics are extremely favorable for the apps and services companies and with AI we're building on top of it. So, so I'm building a lot of companies in the real economy that are increasing productivity. Those things are very economic. In terms of the, the, if it's economic or not for what XAI and Anthropic and OpenAI are doing, that's a, that's, that's a very yeah, tough but, question. But, but all of the apps are being built on top of those frontier models in large part, no? Yes, but, but they're also, they're profitable the things on top are profitable today with our LLMs today, and it's clear LLMs are getting even better. So, so we already have something that's very profitable, very worthwhile today, even if all the right. development stopped. So, so obviously it's in my interest for them to keep investing money, keep getting better, but it already works today. So it's not, it's not a bubble in the sense that there are things that are worth trillions of dollars that, you know, in, in terms of productivity even today. And what do you make, though, of how these things are getting financed? We looked at a fascinating deal just yeah. a week or two ago with Meta and Blue Owl, which effect was a private credit uh, firm, you know, they effectively guarantee that they'll be using the data center for four years. They guarantee some kind of cash out, I think, to 16 years, but they could actually get out at least partially of some of these deals. I mean, some people look at some of this and say, that's a little like WeWork, you know, uh, you're, you know, sh short term rental, 
uh, long-term commitment? They're gonna, listen, they're going to need a lot of capital. I think OpenAI just, just is implying it's going to go public at a trillion dollar valuation, something in the news I read this right. morning. Uh, that makes sense to me. The retail demand for this stuff is really high. It turns out there's a lot of very wealthy people in America who want access to the top of AI and the top of defense. And so they're going to need more capital. I think they're going to get it. And you, you have no, no, no concerns about any of this? Uh, you know, I'm an investor in the things that I know are going to be profitable, the productivity layer, the apps and services layer. Uh, I'm not as big of an investor myself in the model companies. So, so yeah, I am concerned that in, in situations like this, if you echo telecom, there could be right. too much money put to work. How do you think, therefore, about an NVIDIA or an AMD or some of the big chip companies that have benefited from this, but at the same time, they are a lot of it's dependent on the continued build-out and effectively payments longer term from a lot of the, the LLMs and others and the big tech companies to continue to support it? Listen, I, I mean, it's, it's very clear the AI thing is real in the sense that it's working to hugely affect productivity. It just huge growth. If you look at the growth of revenue in these companies, they're going up quickly. In any situation like this, of course, you're going to get them investing way ahead and burning way ahead to grow. That's, that's the nature of it. Uh, but it's, it's clear it's not going away. Uh, Palantir. It's crushing it. It's crushing it. Um, how, you, I, I imagine you believe it will continue to crush it. I love the Jensen announcement. It's the t most the powerful is, on, enterprise on, on, you know, stock in the world. Well, that was the question. What, where do you think, what does Palantir look like to you in five years from now? Listen, Pal Palantir, Palantir is the way that a lot of the biggest companies in the world are deploying AI and productivity and accessing it. And it's succeeding and it's becoming the core stock. Right, but this, the multiple on this is extraordinary at this point. It's, it's impressive. Right. And so my question to you is what has to happen to either grow into that multiple uh, or shift? I mean, how much business do they have to capture and what does that business even look like in the future? You know, I think they have to keep growing at the pace they're growing. And, and it will not look nearly as expensive if it keeps growing at that pace, as you said. Joe says Palantir just needs to maintain its growth rate and the valuation will make sense because they're capturing a slice of every major AI enterprise deployment. Joe calls Palantir the most powerful enterprise stack after the NVIDIA partnership announcement. Joe co-founded Palantir, so obviously he's biased, but his argument holds up when you dig into what's actually happening. He's not saying the valuation is cheap. He's saying if the company maintains its trajectory, the multiple compression naturally happens as the business scales. That only works if there's real underlying momentum, which it looks like there is. Palantir is executing at a very high level. Here's what makes Palantir different from typical enterprise software. Most enterprise software gets adopted department by department. Marketing buys their tools, sales buys theirs, IT buys theirs. Everyone operates in silos. But Palantir forces companies to think differently. When you implement ontology, you're creating a unified way for your entire organization to understand its own operations. Every data source feeds into it. Every decision potentially flows through it. That creates lock-in and that goes way beyond normal software stickiness. You can't rip out Palantir without fundamentally restructuring how your company operates. Now, layering the NVIDIA partnership, the integration lets enterprises build specialized AI agents that understand their specific industry and run on their existing Palantir infrastructure. So if you're already running with Palantir, adding AI capabilities is seamless. If you're not running Palantir, you're starting from scratch while your competitors are already deploying agents. That's a powerful forcing function for adoption. Palantir doesn't need to become a completely different company to justify its valuation. They just need to keep doing what they're already doing, converting large enterprise to their platform and expanding within existing accounts. When you deliver that kind of value, customers don't price shop, they expand usage. The narrative around Palantir always focuses on the multiple looking stretched, but think about what they're actually building as AI becomes core to how every business operates. Someone needs to be the transition layer between raw AI capabilities and actual business logic. That's Palantir and their opportunity. If that thesis plays out, they will generate huge value creation for the market, which many argue warrants their valuation. Picture this, a potential client searches for what your business offers and your YouTube video appears. Before they've even booked a call, they've built trust with you, turning them into a warm lead. That's why our clients are hitting $100,000 months, because YouTube turns attention into authority. If you run a business, book a call and I'll show you exactly how to make this happen.